It's time to break down the Buffalo Bills wild card round opponent, the challenges they present, and what the Bills need to do to deal with them today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. All right, folks, let's break down the Pittsburgh Steelers this game. What the keys to victory are for the Bills? All the stuff that we do here on these primers, and uh, let's dive in. All right, the Bills, they're at home for the wild card round, the super wild card round of the playoffs. They're going to host the Pittsburgh Steelers. The game will be played on Sunday, January 14th, 1 p.m. Eastern time at Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. The game will be broadcasted on CBS. Jim Nance is on the play-by-play. Tony Romo is the game analyst. And Tracy Wolfson is the sideline reporter. This will be the 30th all-time meeting between the Bills and Steelers. And the Bills have an all-time record of 12 and 17 against Pittsburgh. The Bills have faced the Steelers four times under Sean McDermott. So the Sean McDermott versus Mike Tomlin, William and Mary Bull. And the Bills have won three of those four, including the most recent meeting, 38 to 3, back in 2022. That was uh that was a win that put the Bills to four and one, the Steelers to one and four. It was Kenny Pickett's first career start. And Josh Allen had 424 passing yards and four touchdowns. Gabe Davis had a huge day, two touchdowns, 171 receiving yards. Steph Diggs was over 100 yards, 102 yards and a touchdown. And Khalil Shakir, 75 yards and a touchdown. The Bills entered this game 11-6 and and the number two seed in the AFC. And the Steelers are 10-7 and as the number seven seed. The Steelers' 10 wins came against the Browns, Raiders, Ravens twice, Rams, Titans, Packers, Bengals twice, and Seahawks. Uh, So they have five wins over playoff teams. So they've got some good quality wins along the way. Their losses came to the 49ers, Texans, Jaguars, Browns, Cardinals, Patriots, and Colts. As I've already mentioned, the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers is Mike Tomlin, 51 years old. It's his 17th season as the Steelers head coach. He boasts an all-time record of 173, 100, and two, and of course, very famously, in 17 years, has never had a losing season. He is eight and nine in the playoffs, and he has lost his last three playoff games. They've had 10 playoff appearances in 17 seasons under Tomlin. Six of those 10 playoff appearances were won and done. Of course, they did win the Super Bowl back in 2008, and they were the AFC champions in 2010. The quarterback for this team will be Mason Rudolph. Kenny Pickett is healthy. They are riding the hot hand of Mason Rudolph, who sparked the team. They went on a 3-0 and run to close out the season after a, a really bad stretch. They lost three in a row at home to the Cardinals and Patriots. Then they got blown out on the road by the Colts. They put Mason Rudolph in. They win three in a row, and they get to be the number seven seed. That's how they got here. Mason Rudolph, a big part of that. So let's talk about what's happened with Mason Rudolph and um, just how effective he's been for them. 28 years old, was a third-round pick, number 78 overall in 2018 by the Pittsburgh Steelers out of Oklahoma State. Has started 13 career games, and the Steelers have an 8-4-1 and one record in those 13 starts in three starts this season. He's completing 74% of his passes, 180 passing yards per game, three touchdowns, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 118. You know, Mason Rudolph is one of those classic drop-back passers. Six foot five, 235 pounds, very limited in terms of mobility, uh, but 
one of those guys that can stand in the pocket and make throws. And he doesn't have a rocket arm or anything like that. He's got sufficient arm strength. Um, but a guy that really kind of excels with some of his throws on the linear plane, so routes where the guys are running a straight line or like a slant route, that's kind of what he does well. He's not like a, a big-time uh, pick-you-apart guy, but he is one of those classic looks in terms of a, a, a quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Let's look at his metrics over the last three games, uh, and we'll compare them to the rest of the NFL. Again, the Pittsburgh Steelers 3-0 and in those three starts with wins over the Bengals, Seahawks, and the Ravens in Week 18 against, you know, the Ravens rested all their players. They were able to win that game 17-10. to Mason Rudolph's average time to throw is 2.53 seconds. That is the sixth fastest trigger in the NFL. When he gets the ball out in under 2.5 seconds, that's 45% of the time. He completes 77% of his passes. That's 10th in the NFL. His passer rating is 127.7, which is actually number one when he's able to get the ball out of his hands quickly. When he holds on to it over two and a half seconds, that's 55% of the time. Completes 72% of his passes. That's second best in the league. And a passer rating of 113.3. That is sixth best. His average depth of target is 7.3 yards from the line of scrimmage. That's 23rd in the NFL, and 12.7% of his throws are 20 yards or more down the field. That is 15th in the NFL over the last three weeks. And on those throws where he pushes the ball deep, he's four of nine for 181 yards with a passing touchdown, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 128.2, which is seventh best in the NFL. Rudolph is under pressure, 38% of his dropbacks. That is 14th in the NFL. And when he's under pressure, uh, in those three games, he's 16 of 25 for 156 yards with no touchdowns and no interceptions. That's a passer rating of 81.4 under pressure, which is 13th, and a completion percentage of 64%, which is sixth. Now, when he's kept clean and he faces no pressure, his passer rating is 139. That's best in the NFL over the last three weeks with a completion percentage of 80%, which is second best in the NFL. So you can see he's really come in and fared well for Pittsburgh under these circumstances. Uh, he's been blitzed 29% of his dropbacks. There's not a significant difference in his splits with and without the blitz. Uh, with play action, they're 18% play action. That's 25th in terms of frequency. On play action passes, he's not been effective. 7 of 12 for 72 yards. And in fact, his completion percentage drops. So with and without play action, with play action, his completion percentage drops 20%. His yards per attempt drops five yards, and his passer rating decreases by 55 points. So Mason Rudolph, not one of the quarterbacks that have benefited from play action opportunities this year. They do run screens 10% of the time. That is 19th in terms of frequency, 4.3 yards per attempt, which is 22nd. And so the numbers here for Mason Rudolph are, are really good this year. Um, we've seen Mason Rudolph in the past. He actually didn't start any games last year, but he did have 10 starts going into this season and kind of a mixed bag of results certainly has never done anything despite being a third round pick that they drafted with perhaps it in mind that he could succeed Ben Roethlisberger one day never really took control of that opportunity in fact they have since drafted Kenny Pickett in the first round they've paid Mitch Trubisky a decent contract to be a backup as well uh, while they've had Mason Rudolph the whole time so they're riding the hot hand and what's interesting about Mason Rudolph is He's done what a lot of backup quarterbacks have done this year and kind of sparked the team. You think about Bailey Zappi, right? We talked about him a couple of weeks ago with the New England Patriots and how they put him in, they got a spark, they won some games, and the, and the numbers were, were really good. Uh, think about Josh Dobbs and what he was able to do initially in Minnesota, Jake Browning in Cincinnati, even Tommy DeVito with the Giants. You've seen these backup quarterbacks come in and provide a spark, and then eventually they kind of regress back into – the quarterback that they've always been. And I think perhaps that's what's going to happen with Mason Rudolph. He had a great three-game stretch. He's done exactly what the Pittsburgh Steelers need him to do. But if we think this is going to be the new Mason Rudolph, I think that's very unlikely, although he gets a lot of credit for those three games. But I'm guessing at some point, I don't, I'm not going to predict that this, it's this week, but at some point it's going to be just like with Bailey Zappi or Josh Dobbs or Jake Browning or Tommy DeVito where, yeah, eventually they remind you exactly why. They're a backup quarterback, but for the three games to this point, Mason Rudolph has been everything the Pittsburgh Steelers have needed to spark their operation to get them out of a 7-7 hole, to get them to 10-7, and and to get them into 
the playoffs. All right, we're going to break down the rest of this Steelers offense here in just a moment and talk about the keys for the Bills' defense against Pittsburgh, so be sure to stick with me. But folks, you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Well, you don't have to because game time is here, and it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets, all-in prices. They give you a view from your seat and the best price guarantee. I mean, simply put, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. The app is awesome. They have flash deals that are super cool, and they specialize in last-minute tickets. You don't have to plan months in advance. You can check out the day of and see if there's a great deal on tickets. And I also love that they're sent directly to your phone. So if you buy tickets, they're sent right to your phone. You don't have to dig through emails or anything like that. So like I said, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKDOWN. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, folks, the offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers is Eddie Faulkner, 46 years old. He replaced Matt Canada as the team's offensive coordinator in Week 12. So there's some parallels here between the Bills and the Steelers in that they kind of got to a point where they weren't doing so hot. The Bills were 6-6. Six and six, The Steelers were 7-7. Seven and seven. At, at some point, they replaced their offensive coordinator. It somewhat sparks the team, and they get to the playoffs. Uh, but Eddie Faulkner, prior to getting this promotion in Week 12 to being the offensive coordinator, he was the running, back, running backs coach with the Pittsburgh Steelers since 2019. And then before that, he was the tight ends uh, coach and special teams coordinator for North Carolina State from 2013 through 2018. Uh, when you look at the entire picture of this Steelers offense this year, uh, it's not been a great year. I mean, obviously, they've been through three quarterbacks. They've fired their offensive coordinator. Uh, so when I tell you these numbers, you know, just be keeping in mind that there's a, a lot of data that goes into it that's not really true about the team that we're going to see on Saturday. So this season, they did average 17.9 points per game. That's 28th in the NFL. Now, over the last three weeks with Mason Rudolph, they've averaged 27 points per game. For the season, they're averaging 5.8 yards per pass. That is 21st. 4.1 yards per rush. That's 19th and a turnover percentage of 7.7%. That is outstanding, 31st in the NFL. That's a big storyline with Pittsburgh and how they've been able to get to this point to be a 10-win team despite 28th in scoring. Well, they don't they don't turn over the ball. They don't, they don't beat themselves, so they do a good job of that. They're 47% on third down, uh, converting. That's 22nd in the NFL. Red zone offense has been horrible, 48%. Uh, that's 27th in the NFL. They only score a, a touchdown 48% of the time that they get to the red zone. Let's talk about this personnel. At wide receiver, their, their top guy has become George Pickens, a young player out of Georgia. Probably remember him uh, from last year uh, against Kyer Elam. Uh, some back-and-forth battles there. Uh, got some good size, good body control, good ball skills, very good linear athlete. He's not super shifty, uh, but in a straight line, his physicality, his ball skills, he can really make some plays, and he's been quite productive with Mason Rudolph. Uh, the other receiver, Deontay Johnson, has been an excellent player in the NFL, really good route runner, um, and kind of has that dynamic ability, a little bit more speed to him, uh, really shifty type guy, kind of really in, in, different in, than George Pickens in every imaginable way. They're a nice complimentary pair. Then it's Allen Robinson, who's really, really struggled kind of late in his career. He's nothing like the player you watch with Jacksonville. He's since been with the Bears. He's been to the Rams. Now he's with the Steelers and, you know, they're, Kind of a discount, discount, discount George Pickens at this point in his career. You have Calvin Austin, who's small but shifty. One of those guys that um, gives you some, some trouble with the amount of space he can create, and he's really electric with the ball in his hands. He hasn't been super productive this year, but he's one of those guys that if he gets the ball, you kind of hold your breath because you know you can do something special. And then they have another big-bodied guy in Miles Boykin who's not really made much of his NFL career, but he does provide them a size option in the passing game at tight end, Pat Fryermuth uh, last year looked like he was going to be one of the best young tight ends in the NFL. And really the production hasn't been there this year. He's had some injuries. Um, and I think he's a really potent player, but the production this season has been really poor. He's still a talented blocker, but I, I was thinking that Pat Fryermuth was ready to become one of the best tight ends in the NFL. And that hasn't really happened this year. Darnell Washington 
He's their number two tight end. Uh, 270 pound tight end. We talked about him during the draft process. I thought he'd be a great pick for the Bills. Um, he's kind of like a just a freak. He's a freak. He's 6'7, 270. He's fast. He can block. He hasn't had a ton of production this year, but in a game like we're anticipating where it's going to be windy and snowy and cold, you know, an asset like this uh, in the blocking game is going to be important for them. And they also have Connor Hayward, who's kind of built like a fullback, but he plays a lot of tight end for them. So they've got. They got some depth here at tight end, which I think is going to matter in a game like this, where you're thinking extra blockers, heavy formations, throwing the ball short. You know, these types of tight ends kind of really work for that. At right, running back, it's Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Uh, Najee Harris, uh, a first round pick, 6'1, 242 pounds. And he's complimented by Jalen Warren, who I think is the more dynamic player between Harris and Warren. He's 5'8, 215 pounds. So Harris is just big. Right, six one two forty two. Jalen Warren is dense. Right, five eight two fifteen. He's got that Devin Singletary build on him. Maybe a little thicker than Devin Singletary. He can really pack a punch. Really physical runner. Quick feet, and he runs pissed off. He's he's a nice he's a nice player. I like Jalen Warren quite a bit. And these guys, um, they're a nice little pair. They've they've combined for eighteen hundred yards this season. They've really picked it up of late. And you look at these last three games. Uh, Najee Harris has 72 rushes for 312 yards. That's 4.3 yards per carry, 3.46 yards after contact per carry, and four rushing touchdowns. It's a that's really good production. It's almost three and a half yards extra on average per carry after contact. And Jalen Warren's very similar. He has 30 carries, 132 yards, 4.4 yards per carry, 3.27 yards after contact on average. He does have a touchdown. Uh, and two fumbles. He had a couple of fumbles against Baltimore in that that wet game. Uh, but those backs, you know, this is going to be a grounded out game, a physical game. Uh, you're thinking wind, you're thinking snow, you're thinking, you know, just kind of tough conditions to throw the football, particularly for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who don't have Josh Allen at quarterback. Mason Rudolph is much more limited in terms of arm strength and physical ability. You know, they're going to pound the rock with these guys, and they've been They've been really clicking of late. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in just a moment, but that ability to win after contact is, to me, a, a big storyline in this game, and it's something very different than what the Bills have been getting out of their lead running back. James Cook, uh, only 1.94 yards after contact per attempt over his last three games. That is terrible. That is 31st out of 32 running backs over the last three weeks and have at least 30 carries in the last three games. Cook is 31 of 32. And so that's going to be an important dynamic in this game. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but Harris and Warren kind of feel like the exact type of backs you would want in the game that we're about to get into. The Steelers have a very diverse run scheme with a mix of zone and gap runs. Now, when it comes to target distribution under Mason Rudolph, again, the last three weeks, he's been going to George Pickens, uh, 15 targets for him, Jalen Warren, 15 targets, and Deontay Johnson, 14 targets. Those have been the primary options that Rudolph likes to throw the football to. And then after that, it's uh, Najee Harris, Allen Robinson, and Pat Fryermuth with only five targets apiece over the last three weeks. So that's really where they're going with the football. And when you look at the 716 passing yards that Mason Rudolph has, 326 of that to Pickens, and then 180 to Johnson, 70 to Warren, right? I mean, it's it's a very kind of a defined pecking order. But again, the dynamics of this game could really shift some things around. When it comes to this offensive line, uh, their left tackle, Dan Moore, I think he's uh, as average as they come at left tackle. I think maybe a guy that would be better as a swing tackle, um, but he's kind of had that job for a few years now, and I don't think he kills them, but I think they can certainly upgrade. A left guard, this is their best offensive lineman, in my opinion, Isaac Siamalu, came over as a free agent from the Philadelphia Eagles. I think he's an above-average starting left guard. Their center is Mason Cole. Um, kind of a soft anchor type guy, um, more athletic, right? A nimble foot, athletic center, not really a people mover. It's in some ways, a little bit like Mitch Morse uh, in that capacity. Their right guard, James Daniels, super athletic guy. They signed as a free agent from the Chicago Bears. He's been okay for them at right guard. And then their right tackle is their first round pick, Broderick Jones, super dynamic athlete, physical, powerful. And it feels like he, in some ways he's starting to come into his own a little bit. Uh, for them. So that's their offensive line. 
uh, what are my keys here for the Bills on defense against the Steelers offense? Number one, stop the run. Stop the run. This is going to be really critical, especially with the weather that's coming. Uh, the Steelers have the most rushing attempts in the NFL since week nine, and they're averaging 145 rushing yards per game over that stretch. And in their last 10 games, six of them, they've rushed the ball for over 150 yards. They've figured out their identity running the football. They're getting Harris going. They're getting Warren going. The offensive line is gelling. And it's going to be a big assignment for the Buffalo Bills. I think you have to load up on the box. I wouldn't. I would be willing to have an extra box defender. I'd be willing to have some some five man fronts. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do here um, structurally to help defend the run. I would be doing all of that type of stuff. Stopping the run is going to be critical. Invite Mason Rudolph to come to Highmark Stadium in January into the snow and wind and throw throw passes and beat you that way. Dare him to do it. Stop the run. Number two is don't fall victim to the big play. That's been the real story with Mason Rudolph is every start he's hit one or two just massive plays, whether it's Deontay Johnson on a goal ball, George Pickens on a goal ball, George Pickens on a cut and, on, on a catch and run type situation for like 80 yards. You got to not fall victim to that. You have to understand when they're going to try to get those big plays and be ready for them. Number three is I would dress Linval Joseph over Von Miller. I know that the Bills don't have Jordan Phillips, but I would have available for me on game day Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, Puna Ford, Tim Settle, and Linval Joseph. I'd, I'd dress all five of them, and I would not dress Von Miller. This is not a game where he can help you. I don't think he's. I don't think he can help you at all. But especially in a game where it's going to be run heavy, um, just don't, don't bother. Don't bother. You want your best run stuffing players, guys that are going to play with extension, that are going to fit the run, that are going to compete at the point of attack, a.k.a. not Von Miller. Don't dress him. Give Linval Jer Joseph the jersey over Von Miller on game day. And then number four, and, and this is as big of a talking point as there is, sub packages. This is going to be a unique game, and your sub packages are going to be stressed uh, because, well, you're probably not going to have Tyrell Dotson. You're probably not going to have Taylor Rapp, and those are your two most important sub package players in your back seven. When you need that extra safety, it's Taylor Rapp. When you need the extra linebacker, it's Balen Spector, but now Balen Spector is going to be starting alongside of Terrell Bernard. Assuming Dotson can't go, I don't think he's going to be able to go. And so now Spector's LB3, LB2, excuse me, and you're probably going to want to run some three linebacker sets. So who is that going to be? You just signed AJ Klein to your practice squad. Is it him? Is Dorian Williams able to be the Third linebacker, I mean, I have questions about that. Dorian Williams is fast and physical, but if you watch him against the Giants and you watch him against the Patriots, the dude is a mess when it comes to processing and being where he's supposed to be. He makes a ton of full-speed mistakes. I don't think you can put him out there. And so when you go three linebackers, who's that third guy going to be between Medikavich, Klein, or Dorian Williams? And then again, you're when you're looking for that third safety, it's Ben Taylor Rapp. If he can't go, which doesn't look good for him, Cam Lewis is going to have to step up and be physical and, and do those types of things. So it's a shame that Rapp's coming off literally the best game of the season and he's not going to be able to go, and it stresses your sub-package opportunities, which are going to be important in this game because you're anticipating 12 personnel, 13 personnel. They're going to put a fullback out there in, in, in Hayward. They're going to pound the rock, and so you're going to need some heavier personnel not a great week to not have Tyrell Dotson or Taylor Rapp and what that means for your sub-package opportunities. All right, we're going to talk about the Steelers' defense and then, of course, its matchup against the Bills' offense, so be sure to stick with me. But, folks, I know that we come to sports to escape some of the crazy realities of life, but can we be real for a minute about being prepared? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. And that can be pretty scary. Can't imagine a more helpless feeling than one of my loved ones getting sick and that a supply chain issue kept them from getting the life-saving medications that they needed. Well, thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial infections. And look, this stuff can happen to any of us. So be sure to visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. That will be reviewed by a board-certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important than today to be prepared. So go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. 
The defensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers is Terrell Austin, 58 years old, was the defensive coordinator with the Lions from 2014 through 2017, with the Bengals in 2018, and then the Steelers defensive coordinator for the last two seasons, and they've been quite good. 10th in scoring defense in 2022, 6th in scoring defense this year. Again, I mentioned 6th in scoring defense. They're only allowing 19 points per game this season. 342 yards per game, that's 21st, so they give up some yards. They don't give up a ton of points. 6.2 yards per pass, that's 20th. 4.3 yards per rush, that's 21st, and they take it away a fair amount of time. 14% of the time, they take away the football. That's 7th best in the NFL. They're 39% on third down, that is 21st. In the red zone, they do tighten the screws, right? I told you, they gave up yards, but not points. 46% holding teams out of the end zone. Uh, or excuse me, 46% of the time they give up a touchdown. So 54% they keep them out of the end zone, fifth best in the NFL when it comes to the red zone. They blitz a ton, 34% of the time. That's sixth highest in the NFL. 23% pressure rate, that's 11th, and a 7.6% sack rate, that is 10th. Let's talk about their personnel. On the edge, they won't have TJ Watt, but they will have Alex Highsmith, who's an upper echelon edge rusher in the NFL. If you're not familiar with him, get familiar. He's a stud. Marcus Golden, a veteran player in the NFL, not super explosive, but crafty. You know, these types of like veteran pass rushers that know how to use their hands, know how to soften angles, know how to play through contact and just find the football. That's what Marcus Golden is. Nick Herbig, uh, you probably remember him from the preseason game. He destroyed the Bills. Young player. He's a rookie out of Wisconsin, ton of athleticism, and I'm sure they're going to get him going off the edge against the Bills. And then Kyron Johnson, um, Really physical player out of Kansas that I I enjoyed watching at the Senior Bowl and and at Kansas, kind of a rotational player um, that was their fourth guy at this point. On the interior, Cam Hayward, uh, to me, one of the best defensive tackles in the game and has been for a really long time. I think you've you've seen his impact in head-to-head matchups against Pittsburgh throughout the years. He's a stud. you got a really good player in Larry Agonjobi alongside of him. Um, Athletic, can play the run, can rush the passer from the inside as well as Keanu Benton, uh, one of their draft picks this past year out of Wisconsin. You probably remember me hyping him up during the draft. I was hopeful that the Pills would pick him. He goes to Pittsburgh, and he's really emerged and really showing a lot as a pass rusher. They have some depth players that I think are replacement-level guys in Matravius Adams, Armand Watts, and Isaiah Laudermilk. But between Hayward and Agonjobi and Benton and Highsmith and Golden and Herbig, they got a lot of talent there on that defensive line that'll be a big assignment for the Bills protection schemes, and, of course, the offensive line in the run game. At linebacker, they've they've had a ton of injuries here, whether it's Cole Holcomb or Quan Alexander. Uh, so they've turned to Miles Jack, uh, who's who at one point this season retired and came back, and now he's playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Michael Walker, who they signed like in week nine, that's his running mate. So not a ton of experience there for those two linebackers. The guy that does have experience is the kind of the lesser player in a Landon Roberts Longtime Patriot, was with the Dolphins for a while. Kind of a Brandon Spikes type player where he just kind of plugs gaps and can play straight downhill. He can blitz a little bit, but kind of limited in terms of range and coverage ability. But maybe for a game like this that we're anticipating, that he could be an asset to them. At corner, things are going to be interesting here. They've been playing Patrick Peterson at safety. Uh, I anticipate he goes back to corner this week because they're going to get Minka Fitzpatrick and DeMonte Kazee back. So I think their corners are going to be Patrick Peterson, and then one of Joey Porter Jr. or Levi Wallace as the player opposite. They might rotate these guys in. It's going to be interesting to see. They've got three different options that have started games for them. And Levi Wallace, you know him. Patrick Peterson, you know him. And then Joey Porter Jr., second-round pick, long, physical, athletic player, a rookie out of Penn State that I think has a bright future in the NFL. And then the slot player is a pretty solid one in Chandon Sullivan, But they'll also rotate in Eric Rowe to play some in the slot as well, who's kind of a safety player. Who's Eric Rowe is known in his career, and I think that his prime is certainly behind him, but Eric Rowe is kind of known as a a tight end eraser. That was his job for a long time uh, with the Miami Dolphins and uh, Eagles. I think he had a stint in the Patriots as well, that he's been able to do that type of stuff. And then at safety, they do get Minka Fitzpatrick back. And Minka's, you know, all pro caliber player. Has missed a lot of time this year. He he missed weeks 9, 10, 11, and 12, and weeks 16 and 17. And there's it's funny. Some Steelers fans will tell you that they're worst when Minka's on the field because he plays so many roles, and it kind of takes away from other pieces of their defense. I don't know. He's a playmaker that I think is probably going to make them better. Uh, Then who plays next to him is going to be interesting. Is it going to be Eric Rowe, 
um, who's kind of been a hybrid slot safety type player. And then they also get DeMonte Casey back, who was suspended for two games, who's been a starter throughout his career. Physical. He's not big, but he's he's really physical and he um, can play in, in, a, in a couple of different spots as well. So I'm thinking it's going to be Fitzpatrick and Casey at safety. And, that you know, those are a couple of veterans back there. So pretty solid personnel wise. I think obviously their their concerns are at the linebacker position, reacclimating their safeties, and then just kind of settling who's going to play on the outside at corner between Peterson, Porter Jr., and Wallace. So what are my keys for the Bills on offense against this defense? Number one, you got to be able to run the ball with physicality. And that's kind of my concern with James Cook. Uh, he has not done that the last three weeks. One of the worst running backs in the NFL in terms of getting yards after contact. And he kind of gets what's blocked for him and he goes down, right? That physical component of the run game is kind of missing with James Cook. And so I think you need to utilize James Cook and he can help you in this game, but you got to find a physical identity running the football. Leonard Fournette, Ty Johnson, even Latavius Murray, Josh Allen, you got to find physicality in the run game because this is going to be about the line of scrimmage, the trenches, running the football and um, doing it for four quarters. And I think you need to use the depth of your running back room uh, to really maximize that opportunity. Number two is pass protection. This is the type of defense that has given the Bills problems. Odd front, blitz aggressive, and the play man coverage, right? That's kind of what they've what they are, and that's given the Bills trouble this year. We talked about a 34% blitz rate, got a deep group of interior rushers and outside rushers, and, and those interior guys, right, you've seen kind of the struggles that have popped up with Osiris Torrance and some of the pass pro opportunities. Well, here's Cam Hayward, Larry Ogunjobi, and Keanu Benton. So you better figure out your pass protection. You know, you saw this team in the preseason. The Bills were an absolute mess against some of these blitz looks and, you know, how it was navigated both from a Josh Allen perspective and understanding where the the free runners would be and where the protection's vulnerable, and then just the offensive line winning. So big day for the offensive line and pass protection. Again, weather could be interesting here. Not sure what the impact's going to be, but you know that the Bills are still not going to be completely one-dimensional. They're going to throw the football a little bit, and you got to give Josh Allen a chance to get the plays off. Number three is don't fall into the Steelers script. You know, this is the team, like I said, the 28th scoring offense in the NFL. They didn't get here because they're a juggernaut of an offensive football team with a great quarterback. They don't give away the football. They've only given away the football 16 times this year, second fewest in the NFL. They're second best in turnover differential at, at, at plus 11. They don't commit penalties, only 85 penalties this year, six fewest in the NFL. They have a simple formula. Don't beat yourself and invite the opposition to beat themselves. And the Bills have a propensity to fall into that from time to time. You can't do it. Got to take care of the football. Possessions could be limited in a game like this and value the ball. Don't give them short fields. Don't, you know, that's that stuff's going to be critical in this game. And the number four is be the more weatherproof team. It's going to be cold. It's going to snow. There's going to be wind. We've been playing playoff football for 70 years in the NFL. In January, in cities like Buffalo and Chicago and Cleveland in Jersey, and Foxborough, Kansas City, like Cincinnati, whatever, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Part of the deal in building a football team and knowing that your goal is to win the Super Bowl is being able to win in the playoffs. And when you are in Western New York for your home games and you want to play home games in January, you got to be a weatherproof team. And I, don't, I know that weather is going to have an impact on this game. I know that. But you have to be able to overcome that. You have to be able to play in those elements. And the Bills have played in cold and wind. Like, it's happened. Remember the Chicago game last year? End of that Dolphins game last year? Like, this is not new. The Patriots game where the Bills went seven touchdowns in a row. This is not new. And so both teams have to deal with it. You're a team that plays its home games in Western New York. If you haven't been keeping in mind the dynamics that could exist in January football when constructing a football team and developing your plan and developing your identity, and I don't know what to tell you. I want to hear about weather. It's going to be cold, wet, windy. I want to hear about it. You have Josh Allen. You have to be the more weatherproof team. So meet the moment, be physical, run the football, move bodies out of the way, fit the run, get off blocks, make tackles. It's part of the deal. It's part of the deal. It's not like the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's Pittsburgh. It's not Jacksonville or Tampa or Miami or Los Angeles. 
is Pittsburgh. I don't care. The weather, the weather just cannot be something that you look at and say, oh, man, that's going to hurt the Bills. It cannot be that way. January football, you play outside. You've been doing it since 1960. Bills all time at home in the playoffs are 14 and four. Go make it 15 and four and don't use the weather as an excuse. Special teams real quick. They got a great kicker, Chris Boswell, uh, 27 of 28 on extra points this year, 29 of 31 on field goals. He's over 90% this year and he's been over 90% making field goals in four of the last five seasons and six total seasons above 90%. He's excellent. He's 81% for his career beyond 50 yards. They got a stud kicker. Their punter stinks. Presley Harvin, I can't believe he's got a job in the NFL as a punter. Uh, I've watched him for years now. I, every time I watch the Pittsburgh Steelers, I'm like, this guy is a bad punter. Third worst EPA per punt this season. Uh, they actually signed a punter to their practice squad this week, uh, and I think Brad Wing. So maybe they're finally waking up that he's a crappy punter. Hopefully they roll with him. The returner, Calvin punt, Calvin Austin is their punt returner. I have no interest in dealing with that. Small, shifty guy that can take it to the house. Don't give him chances. <laughs> Do not give that guy chances. And then their kick returner is Godwin Iguabuike. I don't know if I said that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. He's a uh, 4-4 speed, modest ca- uh, career production as a kick returner. Uh, you might, I mean, you might feel like you can tackle him, but I'm not dealing with with Calvin Austin, I'll tell you that. So uh, he's he's one of those guys that really makes me nervous as a returner. So there you have it. That's the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, interesting matchup. Really interesting matchup. Um, I feel like the Bills should feel good about this. They're 10-point favorites at home. Third-string quarterback in Mason Rudolph. They don't have their best player in T.J. Watt. But there's some dynamics of this type of game that perhaps play into the Steelers a little bit better than they do the Bills. And so can't take anything for granted. Got to be ready for some big boy football. And uh, I trust that the Bills will. So we'll have one more conversation about this game. Uh, and, of course, talk to Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills about injuries. There's obviously a ton to get in there. You my prediction and all that type of stuff in our last chat that's coming up in our next conversation. So don't miss it. Make sure that you're subscribed. Would love it. If you took a second to rate review and share the podcast, have a great rest of your day. Go bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again. One more time before the bills host the Steelers in the playoffs.